Kate, how did you become involved in the work around modern slavery? Oh, thanks, Rach. Um, I'm slightly nervous that you're going to throw questions back at me now. I thought this was going to be a friendly, celebrating women kind of affair. Um, but yes, anyway, so how I got involved in modern slavery. Um, I outlined this um, in the introduction of the book. So if it's OK, what I'm going to do is mix and match. So I'll read a bit from the book as well as speak about this. So um, as Dougal said, I initially learned about trafficking when visiting and volunteering um, an orphanage in a very small town in Volta in the southwest of Ukraine. Um, and obviously with everything that's happening in Ukraine at the moment, this feels incredibly pertinent to be speaking about the start of my journey with modern slavery in the beginning of Unseen, because in essence, Unseen stemmed from the trips that I took to Ukraine um, and the things that I learned and encountered there. Um, so I think a nod and a moment of um, reflection on what is happening kind of in our wider world at the moment is important. Um, I was a primary school teacher. I uh, was going back and forwards to Ukraine probably about five or six times in the summer holidays. I uh, was volunteering as part of a team running a holiday club out there. And I first encountered the concept of human trafficking, as it was referred to then. We didn't have the concept of modern slavery at that time via one of the young boys that I met telling me his story of how and why he'd ended up in the orphanage. So um, I'm going to read that story to you directly from the book. Um, essentially, it was hearing that that kind of became the driving force for me working in the sector. So it's a kind of an important starting point um, and one that I kind of, I'm not sure I always enjoy looking back on, but it's always an important reminder. So. On a stifling hot day in the summer of 2008, I got talking to Anatoly, sitting under the large shade of a tree in the grounds of the orphanage. We were sitting on the dusty floor under the tree making friendship bracelets, the classic summer club activity, when I asked him via our translator how he had ended up here. The general clamour of the orphanage seemed to stop as I sat under the tree and trying to absorb what I was being told. He, with a few other children, had been my shadow for the week. A cheeky boy with a massively wide grin and hair so blonde it was almost white. His English was good and he had dreams of living in America one day. Via the translator, he told me that he had arrived at the orphanage about three or four years old. He'd been dropped off there by the people who had kidnapped his mother. He described how he and his mother had been walking down the street in their hometown one day when a car pulled up alongside them. His mother had become engaged in a conversation with those in the car. Before he knew it, men had got out of the car and surrounded him and his mum. He remembered how he'd been approached by one of the men and offered an ice cream. And as he turned to show his mum his choice, he saw her being bundled into the back of the car. It was the last time he saw her. He was taken to an orphanage and some years later transferred to the one where we were to meet. When we spoke, he had no knowledge of where his mum was or if they would ever see each other again. The translator suggested to me that his mother would have been potentially forced to sell sex for money, that she'd been trafficked for sexual exploitation. And at these times, th at this time, these were words I did not fully comprehend. A conversation with the orphanage director later in the week confirmed the disturbing fact that there were people who waited outside the orphanage gates when the time came for children to move on. These people offered places to stay, to work, and sorry, people offered places to stay and work and opportunities that would never transpire. Alone, homeless, and with little or no income, the children were at clear risk of exploitation. As director, she was resigned to the fact that for some of them, there was little she could do. As the boys continued to make friendship bracelets in the shade of the tree, I remember having a hundred and one questions I wanted to ask. Injustice raged inside of me, inside of me, a sense of unfairness overwhelmed me. I tried my best not to let my emotions show. This was just one child's experience. There were over 150 children in the orphanage. What if Anatoly and the orphanage director had described what to be, was to be the fate of all these children? What if many of them were destined to be kidnapped or promised the world at the orphanage gates? They were no longer faceless and nameless children. They were children I knew and children I cared about. So that was kind of my first experience, I guess. And um, from this trip and this interaction and what I'd learned, it kind of wouldn't leave me. Um, it just kept bugging me. So I spoke to Andrew about it, who is um, the CEO of Unseen and who I started the organisation with. And I expressed my frustrations and my concerns about the children and the risk of trafficking. And uh, 
he told me that he had heard similar stories previously and he basically posed a challenge to me that was along the lines of what are you going to do about it? The short version of the story is that our conversation and his challenge led to the creation of Unseen at the end of 2008, so 2008. Um, and again, to shorten a very long and roller coaster ride of a journey, um, in 2011, Unseen opened its first safe house for women. And then over the next eight years, uh, developed a longer term resettlement service, opened a men's safe house, established um, the UK's modern slavery helpline, piloted a children's home, developed anti slavery partnerships, and offered a range of training to professionals. So, an utter roller coaster of a ride, um, and one that I am incredibly proud to have played a small role in. Um, I left Unseen um, in late 2020, um, so it was the right time to step away, I think, as I call it, from the sharp end and to work out how to use everything I'd learned and seen to attack and try and influence the kind of issue from another angle. So I knew I wanted to carry on working in the sector and tackling modern slavery, but also um, knew that it was time to, for Unseen and I to kind of to go our separate ways. Um, super, super hard to step away. Felt like the right time thing to do and time for a new chapter. Uh, but I am incredibly proud to have been involved um, and really enjoy cheering everyone unseen on from the sideline and seeing all the amazing things um, that you guys still get up to. So that's kind of the, the whistle stop tour of how I got involved in modern slavery. The um I, I, I suppose on reading your book, Kate, I'm kind of um I'm from what you've just said as well around kind of like the, the terminology that's used around modern slavery and human trafficking and kind of how that's changed and everything that that encompasses. I just wondered if you could give everybody a quick summary of what modern slavery and human trafficking is. Sure. Um, so modern slavery encompasses human trafficking, slavery servitude and forced and compulsory labour. And the term modern slavery came to fruition under the Modern Slavery Act of 2015. So the UK is in a slightly unique position. Um, I believe it and Australia are probably the only countries that use the terminology of modern slavery. Um, everyone else, especially across Europe, is very much kind of trafficking in human beings. Um, so there is, um, I suppose in the UK, modern slavery is a, an overarching term that encompasses um, human trafficking. Um, Rach, should I just kind of up, break down human trafficking? Would that be useful? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So human trafficking consists of three basic parts action, means and purpose. So it's what happens, how it happens and why it happens. Um, and all three components, so the what, the why and the how, have to be present um, in order for an adult to be considered to be trafficked. Um, although it is really important to note that someone doesn't actually have to have experienced exploitation. So it can be the intent that they were going to be exploited that it actually have to have been. Um, and then for children, the um, how it happens. So a child can't consent to their own abuse, so they don't need to evidence that element of it. Um, in the UK, it can take many different forms. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware, sexual exploitation, forced labour, domestic servitude, forced criminality and the removal of organs. Um, removal of organs as really um, low numbers in the UK, um, but it does happen on a global level. And then I guess in the UK, we also see it across multiple sectors. So um, kind of the sectors that we have seen slavery and trafficking in would be agriculture, um, construction, hospitality, food processing and kind of service industries. Um, handily, the government released statistics last week um, that look at the numbers in the UK. So I will um, just unpick those. So I think it's helpful for people with the large caveat that numbers only tell us one, what we look for. And two, everyone probably in the sector believes that they are tip of the iceberg. Um, a report that was published, I think, around 2020 by Centre for Social Justice um, said that there were, they think there are about 100,000 victims in the UK. Now, that number is huge and incredibly worrying when our systems last year only found 16,000 victims. So when we talk about tip of the iceberg figures, um, it is kind of terminology the sector use quite often, but it also is just the fact that we are not sure what the real number of slaves and potential victims in the UK is. So there were 16,000 people identified last year. Now that number breaks down into to two parts. So nearly 13,000, so the exact number for those who are interested, 12,727, if I've got that right, um, were entered into the national referral mechanism. Now, this is a mechanism that helps identify and provide support to those who've been trafficked. In order to get into that mechanism, as an adult, you have to consent to do so. 
So those 12,727 people identified are people who professionals have spotted, offered assistance to, and then people have said yes to that help. So quite a small number if we compare it to the 100,000. The remaining 3,000 roughly have been identified by professionals, but for whatever reason decided not to enter the support system. All of these 3,000 people are adults um, because any child that is identified as a potential victim should be automatically entered into support by a local authority social care and those kind of support structures. So we're talking about 3,000 adults who are identified as potential victims who in effect are not being supported. And that is an incredibly worrying figure. So professionals have interacted with somebody and for whatever reason at that time, they aren't able to accept, they are scared about leaving their situation, they don't want to accept the offer of support, um, so haven't come away with a professional. And I think that kind of always intrigues me that we know potential victims are out there, they haven't kind of come away or been assisted, and yet, so then I kind of start asking the question, is the support that we offer what people need? Are we kind of offering the right thing through the systems and the services? And that isn't that the charities working on the front line aren't doing their best and offering kind of the services once people are in the system that they need, but actually are we truly connecting with those people? So just, I thought that was really interesting. The government will always talk about the 13,000 figure, but actually there's another 3,000 people that we know are out there that we haven't been able to support. Um, so kind of in a nutshell, we've got 12,727 potential victims identified last year. That's a 20% increase from 20, 20, 2019. Pandemic potentially um, impacted those numbers. Of these, and this is very interesting, on International Women's Day, 77% were male. So we had nearly 10,000 potential victims identified were men um, and only 3,000 um, female. For adults, um, it was about 50% um, identified were adults and the most prominent type of exploitation was labour exploitation for adults and for children uh, the most prominent exploitation type was criminal exploitation um, and before um, this started Rachel and I were just chatting about kind of the things that Unseen are saying in terms of criminal exploitation um, and the impact that that's having on some of the people that Unseen is supporting. Um, most three common nationalities been the same I think now for maybe the last three years uh, UK nationals, Albanian nationals and Vietnamese nationals. Um, so that's a bit of a kind of overview, I guess, of the current numbers. Um, I'm always nervous to use global figures like 40 odd million are enslaved and all this kind of stuff, just because I think it's just it's so big. And I think that's something I really tried to do through the book was kind of make sure that it was about the one person. Because in my mind, the fact it's happening to one person is kind of too many. Um, so, yeah, I think that would uh, that's a maybe a long answer to your question, but hopefully it's a this is modern slavery. These are the numbers. No, that's really helpful. Thanks, Kate. Um, and, I, and very timely with figures from last year um, coming out as well. And I think certainly with nationalities, it's what we see within Unseen as well. And so I suppose we kind of follow national trends in some way. Um, in your book as well, Kate, so you kind of talk about the the challenges that the with with the system of support. Um, I think that's kind of um, explored like really thoroughly and very well. Um, but kind of given your experience and background with Unseen and kind of where it all started, um, how did you come to the idea of the book? Um, so I suppose why, why, why did the book come um, to, to fruition? Good question. Um, so the simple answer is I was speaking at a community care event and chatting to social workers and um, there happened to be a publisher in the audience and he ran up to me afterwards and said, um, could you write a book please about modern slavery and make it for social workers? Um, because I think they need to know about this. And I was like, hmm, I could do, but I think probably I'd like to make it wider than just social workers. Um, so it's been said that I like a challenge. So I said yes. Um, didn't really think much of it. Then got a contract sent through and was like, I don't understand what I'm meant to be doing. I don't even really have an idea for the book apart from modern slavery. What am I doing? Um, so I said yes, like a challenge. And from that point on, it only took me four years to actually sit down and write. So I kept having lots of ideas and then didn't actually sit down and write and was working full time with Unseen. So it wasn't necessarily, um, I guess, conducive to then writing as well. But I think, um, so that's how it happened. I think why the book? Um, it's a good question. Three, three main kind of reasons, I think, um, that I'll go into a little bit. So one was to reveal the direct and indirect impacts of non-slavery. Um, 
The second thing was to expose, and I think that's um, exposing the systems, the support structures, the policies and the legislation that I guess in my mind, to a certain extent, allow modern slavery to continue. And then the third thing would be to suggest ways that we could work together to reimagine what all these things could look like um, and how to tackle modern slavery and realise the part we play in it. So I think there for me, there's a realisation as much realisation and a frustration, I think, that modern slavery is still not always an issue that people know about. Um, and I think when you work in it day out, day in, day out, you do find it slightly, I do have that sense of disbelief that people have completely missed every single news article and every single organisation and everything that's going on around this topic. I mean, obviously I'm speaking to an audience here who's on the same page, um, but I understand that it's an issue that people sometimes don't feel equipped to deal with. And I also understand it's an issue that can feel incredibly overwhelming for people. So I guess once I started to think about it all and actually realised I had to write because I'd signed a piece of paper that said I was contracted to do so, um, I wanted to try and write a book to help people understand and interact with the issue and those it affects through the lens of people's stories. And I wanted to take um, the experiences and interactions I had had and share my understanding of what I'd learned and seen over the 10 years of working in the unslavery sector. So I kind of wanted to use what the privilege, I guess, and the experiences and the people I'd met sitting on brothel floors, in car washes, in detention centres, in takeaways, in police vehicles, in custody, all of the kind of random situations I'd found myself in during the work with Unseen. And I wanted to honour and give voice to those who are yet able to do this for themselves um, and share some of those interactions. And now, hopefully in the book, it is intended to be incredibly clear that all of those interactions are from my perspective and my recollections of them. So I am really keen to not be putting voice into survivors' mouths. That's not my role. And one of the chapters does have um, interviews um, that were conducted with survivors, which is absolutely fantastic. But I think, in essence, they serve as really powerful illustrations of how close modern slavery is to us and the devastating impact it can have. Um, and I think I did want the book to be challenging. Um, I wanted people to read it and wrestle with it. I didn't want people to be overwhelmed with it. Like, you don't want people to be overwhelmed to a point of paralysis. But I did want people to kind of walk away understanding the issue and then maybe our role as society and as individuals in society to work out how how we wrestle with it and how we potentially facilitate one slavery in the things that we do and buy and also then how we potentially use the powers that we have to help stop it. And I guess the reality is that trafficking hasn't stopped since we started Unseen. Um, I was reading a report earlier today preparing for this from Lumos um, and Lumos are an organisation that work with children in orphanages and they were sharing data that just showed that children are still being trafficked out of institutions and that children that are in institutions and don't have family are so much more likely to go missing and are vulnerable to exploitation than children that have a family structure. In essence, they're kind of easy targets. And again, reading that today, it was incredibly sobering um, kind of in itself, but then amplified in the light of what was happening in Ukraine as well. Um, so I guess that's the why. I mean, the book, I guess it talks about the reality of modern slavery, defines modern slavery, uh, talks about the different types, where we're aware of it, has got a couple of chapters on the legal parameters. I'd recommend people maybe skip that if they're not interested in like legal bits and get back to the stories. Um, and it looks at the systems, Rach, as you said, that are in place um, and what happens in those support systems when it goes right and what happens when it goes wrong and the impact that directly has on people. Um, so yeah, I took it on as another challenge, I guess, and uh, I'm still slightly overwhelmed that it's in a physical kind of thing now and that people are actually reading it. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think you speak really well about kind of the importance of um, I was sharing uh, your experience of kind of um, what, what you've seen when you've spoken with survivors, as you said, in like a range of um, different environments. Um, can you share some of the effects that you've seen um, that modern slavery has had on women and um, kind of what that looks like within the UK? Sure. Um, it was so International Women's Day, but the caveat again on this is that lots of the effects and impacts of trafficking are not based on gender lines. And I think it is really important to kind of just to note that um, and when I um, first started, when we first started Unseen, 
any media coverage or conversation on this topic and support services was all geared towards girls and women and it was all sexual exploitation. So that was the only way that we were viewing trafficking. Um, from my own experience, really quickly learned that sexual exploitation was not the only type of trafficking women are experiencing and learned this very, very quickly, opened the doors of the safe house and the first two women that referred to us had been trafficked for domestic servitude. So there is me planning the safe house for two years. We had all the policies, all the procedures, everything in place, all around sexual exploitation and the services people would need and incredible learning curve immediately that um, the people have been trafficked for domestic servitude. So it's really good that our understanding societally and the sector has grown from the early days. We understand now modern slavery is far more complex than we thought it was and it is an ever-changing indiscriminate crime um, and I think we are often kind of lagging behind understanding some of the forms that it now takes. Again if we look at the figures from last year we have 9,000 men and only 3,000 women. Now this could easily be because what we're looking for has changed. It could be that resources and priorities of services have altered. So I think, please hear, I'm not saying for one minute that I think women being trafficked has reduced or stopped. I just don't think we're identifying it effectively or finding it. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, having said that, I did go back and look at the stats to kind of try and answer your question, Rach, around the impact on women. Um, and I wanted to look at the trends for girls and women. So of the 2,923 women and girls identified last year, 1,700 cases had an element of sexual exploitation in them. So of the women who were identified as potential victims, 58% involved sexual exploitation. So we're seeing that the majority of trafficked women in a UK context are trafficked for sexual exploitation. Um, and just because I like doing this, I compared it to the figures for men, just so we have a kind of a comparator. And uh, sexual exploitation is only prevalent in 4% of cases of, for men in the UK. So obviously men and women can both be trafficked for sexual exploitation and sexual assault can be used by traffickers as a control mechanism regardless of gender. But it appears from those figures that sexual exploitation in the UK disproportionately impacts women. So that was one thing. I suppose another form of exploitation that we don't talk about much in the UK um, and I'm actually, as I was writing this, I wasn't sure or thinking about it, wasn't really sure where it fits in the UK structure. Um, but there are 15 million women in forced marriages across the world. So I don't really like the big numbers, but that is a, it's a statistic that we don't hold in the UK. So there are certain types of marriages um, under forced marriage that would be classified as an example of modern slavery or human trafficking, but it's not something that's classified in the UK stats. I have come across one case in my career of um, someone who was actually stopped being forced into a marriage um, but it came at the point of her trafficker saying um, she basically said I don't want to do this anymore I need out she was being sexually exploited and the trafficker basically said you're not leaving um, I will make you stay or you can marry this guy for your EU citizen then he can kind of have EU citizenship so that's the only example of forced marriage I've come across um, but it is something I'm aware that kind of again worldwide disproportionately affects girls. Um, this then got me thinking about uh, I guess the consequences for women uh, being sexually exploited and the fact that these are different to when a man is sexually exploited so um, I'm going to just dive right in with some things that I thought about I guess and basically in relation to pregnancies and the potential decisions that come with this. So I've met women who have not understood how reproduction works, they haven't understood they're pregnant, one woman didn't even know how pregnancy occurred. Um, I've met uh, one lady, actually I say a lady, she was definitely still a teenager who had had a, an abortion um, in a garage. Her trafficker had forced her, that on her. Um, and I guess women who will find themselves in that situation are having to consider their options in relation to choosing whether they want to remain pregnant or not and all of the decisions that that entails. Um, so I think when I was thinking about impact on women specifically, um, acknowledging sexual exploitation happens to both or all genders, I actually felt that women kind of biologically could become pregnant and that then kind of has some impact on them. I then thought other consequences that appear, and I'm not stating they do, but appear to impact women more, um, have been cases where the women have been primary carers of children or single parents. Um, and this has I've seen happen in two ways. One, the support that is offered to them may not be able to assist their children. 
And then they have a tough decision about putting their children's needs above their own. And I would say probably, Rachel, I don't know if you would agree with this, but most mothers that uh, I have worked with will always put their children's needs above their own. So that's kind of one thing. Mm -hmm. And then I also think the other thing is when children are in care already um, and working out how a mum maintains a child, um, a relationship and kind of all the meetings and contact when the services for mum are out of the area where the children are being housed. And again, I think those are things I've seen that have really impacted women. Um, I also think, and this is possibly anecdotal, but I do think that women appear to be detained and prosecuted for lesser offences and lower level offences than men are. And they are then not noticed that these offences may be linked to the fact that they are being exploited. So I think, again, there is a trend there with women specifically. And then um, a case I've worked on recently um, has flagged for me that there is an indication that women are increasingly being used by criminal gangs, mainly to transport drugs and mainly because they don't raise as much suspicion with the authorities than men do. So it's almost like we now understand that young men and young boys are trafficked or kind of moved from city to city in county lines activity. But actually, if you get a woman driving a car on her own, the likelihood of her being stopped by the authorities is far lower. So I think it's it's a really tricky one um, because it obviously does impact men and women, but obviously International Women's Day, and we're talking about the impacts on women. So those are some of the, the things that I kind of thought about. Yeah, I think it's um I think it's really good to look at those trends actually, Kate, because I think um I think it kind of demonstrates just how much it shifts. Like as soon as you feel like you understand something, it shifts again and you know, it, it, how it impacts um women in particular. I think where you look at kind of sexual health and pregnancies and things like that, I, it can be quite easy to assume that someone's just getting support, but actually there's a lot of practicalities for single mothers. Um that make it very hard to engage with services but then you've also kind of got the emotional attachments as well and a lot has been asked of young mothers to leave children to then access their support so um, it is very complex. Um, I'm mindful of kind of how important the uh, stories of survivors are um, particularly in your book and also in the work but um, I just wondered if you could share some stories with us of women that you've met um, and, and how that's impacted you. Sure um, so um, I will read a bit again if that's all right. So I'm going to um, introduce you to a woman called Anna, who is a 20 year old Romanian. She was trafficked for the purpose of sex exploitation. Her story does appear throughout the book in different places, um, but for this evening I've condensed it and combined it. Um, so uh, excuse me as I flick through various bits. I have kind of, hopefully I won't get lost. I've got them tabbed. Um, Good. So let's have a look here. Right, so Anna's story. Classically, I can't actually find the first page of it. Right. Go. So, um, as I said, she was trafficked for the purpose of sex exploitation. Um, worth noting, she was an EU citizen, uh, which meant she was legally allowed to be in the country and also legally allowed to work. Um, I met Anna when I was working a shift in the Women's Safe House. Um, Anna believed when leaving her home in Eastern Europe that she'd be heading for a better life. With limited access to education, the job market, or in her, in her mind, much of the future, she jumped at the chance to work abroad. Anna did not realise that the lady who befriended her would not fulfil her promises to her. Anna arrived at the safe house in a lurid, fluorescent pink fluffy dressing gown. She had nothing else with her. No bag, no possessions, literally the clothes on her back. She had travelled dressed like this, and no one had thought to see if they could offer her a different outfit or something more comfortable. Anna, like many other women, had been forced to sell sex. She received no benefit for the services she supplied and did so under the force or threat of force. She had been deceived, believing England would offer her better job opportunities. She was naive and trusting, and this was taken advantage of. She had very little in her home country, nothing to lose, and the promise of better and more was more attractive and more alluring. The woman who offered her the job had selected Anna specifically, pretended to be befriend her and appeared to be a good friend by helping arrange her travel arrangements, her documents, her transportation and organising a job that never transpired. This woman knew what she was doing. She knew Anna had little to lose and, and trusted her. 
Preying upon Anna and using the relationship built with her, she brought her to the UK and forced her to sell sex. Anna had been made to believe that she was complicit in her own trafficking, that this was somehow her fault. Being unaware of the support structures and her entitlements, she was dependent on the woman who was exploiting her. Anna was received a decision that said she was positively trafficked and, and given temporary leave. This allowed Anna's support to continue in the safe house and for her to get access initially to supported accommodation and to apply for benefits when she left while she worked out her next steps. With support, Anna moved out of the safe house and into independent accommodation locally. It was some years later that I next encountered Anna. We had ad hoc reports from other agencies about her and the potential of her being in an abusive relationship, but were unable to provide her with any support or ongoing contact. I was part of the panel providing my opinion on trafficking decisions along with a range of other professionals. On one occasion, as I was reading through paperwork, I began to feel my stomach churn and bile rising at the back of my throat. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I hoped it wasn't true, but the wind was literally knocked out of me. Maybe Anna was a popular name. Maybe it wasn't the person I knew three years previously who I was reading about all over again. I dearly wished it would not be the girl who had successfully moved on from her experiences and been strong enough to give evidence in a criminal case. But it was. For the first time in my career, I was reading about someone I knew being re-trafficked and re-exploited. Up until this point, all the information about re-trafficking had been anecdotal, based on the assumption that if people didn't get access to support and the right to work, they may again be faced with tough decisions about how they support themselves and be vulnerable to exploitative practices. According to the reports, Anna had moved in with her boyfriend, leaving the city she had been relocated and supported in, leaving any support structures that had been established behind. Her boyfriend had access to the compensation she had received and took advantage of this. When the money ran out, she was expected to sell sexual services to provide money. She didn't do this consensually and was forced by her partner. She was a victim of circumstance and her own vulnerability twice. I don't know what happened to Anna in the end. The group of professionals reviewing her case agreed she'd been trafficked and fit the criteria. She'd previously been given the right to stay in the UK, so I can only hope that she was able to access the support she needed. There are currently no assurances that victims want out, once out of their situation of exploitation will not find themselves in another similar situation in the future. And I, I guess I think her story always reminds me that we get to join people for a really short time and we don't always know what happens to them. And as you heard in Anna's case, there are lots of ups and lots of downs and lots of hopes and things looking like they're going well and then those hopes get dashed and I don't think someone might be able to tell me I'm wrong but I don't think I put it in the book but I think the reason that Anna's story impacts me so much is that I also um, met her one day outside of work between these two experiences um, I was at a local college and all of a sudden at the corner of my eye there was someone shouting my name and running towards me and flinging their arms around me and it was Anna and she was studying and I remember two things I remember feeling incredibly awkward because I was in a had a different hat on and also it was like boundaries boundaries and she kind of flung herself at me so I was like trying to get to that awkward side hug moment because I didn't want to reject her but also didn't want to be unprofessional um and also incredibly privileged that I'd got to see that she was doing okay and I don't know how long that lasted for because as you heard in her story the next time I heard about her she'd been re-trafficked but I think that's why it's that kind of that roller coaster for the individuals involved um, and the choices that they have. So I think that's that's a story that has kind of stayed with me and impacted me um, quite a lot. Yeah, that was, um, thank you for sharing. It's, yeah, I appreciate it. it probably never gets easy reading or kind of revisiting that whole process. But um, I think sometimes it can feel kind of like overwhelming and you're kind of trying to figure like out a way forward and kind of see, um, see the good that I suppose kind of, um, goes on but I suppose final question from me at the moment would be what can what can we do what could what could people on this call do to help great okay so I've got three answers um so I'll be super short with them because I know there are lots of questions coming in um that Rachel's going to answer for you <laughs> um, <laughs> so um there are a few ideas in the book um and uh, the first one I'd say is um, there's something called the slavery footprint, which if you Google, you will find uh, it's an online survey that lets you as individuals look at how many slaves potentially work for you. 
And it's just a really good way of going, actually, what about the food I buy? What about the clothes I buy? What about the technology I buy? And what in my behaviour could I change? So that's kind of, that's one of the first things I think if people are looking for actions. I think the next thing, um, and it's incredibly topical, is I mentioned the report that I read by Lumos earlier on, and I was really struck by a statement in it that basically said, conflict increases vulnerability. And at this juncture, um, the report then goes on to refer to past bombings in Ukrainian schools in previous kind of wars that Ukraine have faced. And it just really struck me that what's happening in right now offers traffickers the opportunity to prey on vulnerable people. The fact that dads are staying behind to fight, sending their families to safety means that families are being separated, which means mums and children in effect face more vulnerability. Um, there was a news report earlier this week, I know it's only Tuesday, so it might have been over the weekend, but speaking about the Polish police at the border intercepting and arresting traffickers, um, they were offering transport and assistance to Ukrainians, but were planning on trafficking them. And again, this just highlighted that war and conflict provides opportunity to exploit. Um, so again, you know, Rachel and I have both worked in this sector for a really, really long time, um, and still I'm flabbergasted at where people see the opportunity to exploit people. So I guess there's something to be done in terms of supporting those from Ukraine and hope that this kind of may form some form of like, I guess, trafficking prevention. And I know I'm seen of providing helpline numbers and lots of stuff on social media and resources for this purpose, which is great. So check out what they've got. Um, I also know that there are some organisations coordinating support on the ground. Um, and I guess I would recommend people get in touch with people doing that. I saw earlier on Twitter today that the local MP in Bristol, and I know not everyone will be based in Bristol, but a local MP in Bristol has literally provided a resource sheet for people to kind of like official authorised organisations. So I hope this will be replicated in other areas. Um, so I'm sure kind of any resources that we come across, um, we can probably share after this event. And then the final thing I think would be the Nationality and Borders Bill. Um, since Leaving Unseen, most of my time has been spent working on this. Um, so I've been working with the Rights Lab at Nottingham University, um, various MPs and peers on this bill. Um, it is a bill that in essence conflates immigration and modern slavery and will be massively detrimental um, to victims. We think as a sector, the whole sector is calling for modern slavery to be completely removed from the bill. Um, it will negatively impact identification, support, protection and reduce the number of prosecutions of criminals. So overall, it is really not a great thing. The final session of the reading of the bill starts in the House of Lords earlier today, so at three o'clock. Um, and the session is still going on. So if you have nothing else to do with your evenings, um, you can tune into Parliament TV after this, which is what I will be doing. Um, and this evening session is going to look at the modern slavery part of the bill. Um, and the Lords have put several challenges and changes forward, which is absolutely great. We've worked really closely with the sector um, and the government kind of probably mid-March, early April will vote on the bill. Um, what this means is that there is still time to write to your MP. So basically it's in the House of Lords now, they will suggest their changes, it will go back to government, it will go back and forward between the Commons and the Lords. And actually, if people raise enough noise about the whole bill, because um, obviously it's awful in its entirety, but specifically around the modern slavery element, um, before this vote takes place, um, that would be absolutely fantastic. So again, a really practical thing you can do, and I know that Unseen, along with other agencies and organisations on their website, have got a link. Um, I think it might have just gone up, um, but they've got a letter that you literally can just send off to your MP. So I would really encourage everyone on this call, get friends, family. Basically, if you write to your MP, they have to do something about it. So kind of get going, people. The letter's there. Um, and I think those are kind of hopefully some, some good starting points. Um, my editor and publisher would say, you have to buy the book. That would be a fourth thing, but I, I always feel awkward about that. But um, <laughs> there is a discount code if people do want to do it. Um, so yeah, I'll just ignore that bit. But the main three things are check out Savory Footprint, understand where you intersect with it, um, maybe get involved in the whole Ukraine thing, really, really timely, and it will make a difference. And also write a letter to your MP about the madness of the Nationality and Borders Bill. Very good recommendations. Thank you. Um, I will... Um pop over to the questions channel so i think we've answered maybe a couple of questions on what can we do um so i'll come to ella's question so um how do you find the balance of working with victims and keeping your passion while not feeling overwhelmed rach do you want to start on that one seeing as i technically don't work on the front line anymore 
I'm happy. I'm happy to answer it, but please, you you could also answer it. Um, I can. You go first. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think after 12 years of working kind of on the front line, in essence, and helping to run unseen, I did need to step away. Um, and I think at the point where your passion, whatever time frame that is, starts to wane, I think there is a discussion that you have to have with yourself. So um, I do think you can't always keep the passion, um, but at that point, it's about working out if that is then impacting the service that you are able to provide as an individual. Um, and I think it's also kind of on a general note, it's having stuff outside of work. And it is uh, we're all on our own journeys, I guess, of learning how to switch off, of learning how to put things down. It's incredibly hard when we um, are passionate about the work and it's such important work. And there'll be lots of people on this call that are doing really important work. And it is hard to, to let it go and leave it. And I think, um, but we have to, we are, our role is not to save everybody. And there is a real danger in this sector um, and kind of the charitable sector of kind of savior complexes and everybody wanting to rescue and thinking we're the only ones that can do it. And that just isn't true. So I think there's there's some internal reflection and stuff to do. There's some self-protection and having good stuff outside of work. And there's also just accepting that at some point, probably everyone will reach a stage where they can no longer do their best and that's okay. I don't know if that answers that, but. No, I think, I think that's good. And I think, it, you know, it, it can quite easy, it can be quite easy to get to overwhelm quite quick. I think even when you look at data and you see numbers go up, 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 you kind of see the, the nature of the issue, issue shift. Um, you then have that kind of reinforced by very, very personal stories that you're kind of um, very privileged to hear. And I think um, Kate spoke really well about the fact that, you know, we're, we're only in people's lives for a very, very small snippet. Um, and you just hope that when when they do leave service that they kind of go on to um, to something fantastic and settled and stable and secure and that they're able to kind of um, access opportunities and all of those things that we take for granted. I think you just hope that when people leave services or leave a safe house that, that they have that as well. Um, I would say that there is something quite inspiring about the sector though in that we have seen an awful lot of change. Um, even during my time at Unseen, which has been like three or four years, um, you know, we've seen um, additions made to support services. Now, is that always right? Is it is it the most trauma informed way of working? You know, you can always um, find um, things that could be better, but we are definitely um, working together as a sector to really um, get behind very significant changes that we know are going to benefit survivors in the long term. So the fact that you've kind of got a whole sector pulling in that same direction that are really kind of unified in that struggle, I think it feels quite a, um, an incredible thing to be part of. So um, I think that's kind of what keeps getting me out of bed in the morning for sure. Um, so I will just scoot um, through to the next question. Dougal, do I have time? Fab, okay, and I think we've got that about what we can do next. Um, okay, question from David. So, um, considering the effect of climate change, enforced migration, the evolution of modern slavery um, can involve migrants and refugees willingly submitting to harsh social and economic conditions and desperation. What systemic approaches could be adopted by governments and businesses um, to be modern day slavery proof? And is there a need to transit from consultancy to a regulatory obligation at Unseen? Sorry, that's a long question. I mean, I'll leave you on the regulatory approach to Unseen. Mm -hmm. um, um, systemic approaches. So I think there are some really, this is going to sound um, maybe crass, but um, kind of lifting the ban on people working. So our policy at the moment in terms of immigration is, in my opinion, absolutely appalling. So um, people seeking asylum and refugee kind of which if people were leaving um, countries are impacted by climate change, you arguably will have kind of more movement patterns. Currently in the UK, they wouldn't be eligible to work and they might not even kind of be eligible to enter the country. So I think there are some real systemic changes around lifting the ban, allowing people to work, Kind of welcoming people to come in, appreciating different people's skills, etc. Um, and I would love to see government planning for this. Like climate change is happening, um, the things you mentioned will occur. So actually, we could be ahead of the curve and plan for them. But obviously, on four-year government cycles, um, that is unlikely to happen. But I do think there are some systemic approaches there that could be kind of used. Um, and arguably, you could use the kind of, I suppose, the the funnel of business to do that. 
if business is saying we would like talent from X, Y, and Z, and we need more people from these countries and these places, actually kind of that business and government kind of dynamic could, could really help um, in some of those things. Perfect. Sorry, I've just um, skipped into the next question. It's another good one um, as we kind of move out of COVID as well. Um, so travel restrictions during COVID reduced the number of um, potential victims of modern slavery arriving from overseas. Um, do you expect to see a disproportionate increase in the coming months to meet pent up demand? Um, I would imagine the answer to be yes, especially with current world events and people transiting and moving more. I think my concern with answering just yes would be that we are seeing a massive increase in British nationals being trafficked and exploited. And we also, um, I think societally and governmentally, are not very good at holding two things in tension at once. So I think what's going to happen is instead of looking at foreign nationals who have been trafficked, it's going to kind of pendulum swing around and we're going to be looking at British nationals and criminal exploitation. And I think focus and resource is going to go into that, which may mean this side is still happening, but we may not see the increase in numbers because our focus is over here. Um, so, yeah, I think the answer is yes. I think there will be an increase as kind of travel corridors reopen. Um, there was a really interesting stat from a few years ago that... Um, the number of people identified as trafficked in the UK from other countries, actually the vast majority of them did not enter clandestinely. So they didn't come in on the dinghies, they didn't come in under lorries, they came in through normal travel routes with valid visas at their time of entry. Um, so I do think as as the world opens up again, that is bound to, to start happening again. I would think it's, um, it's also quite interesting at the moment, I'm just reflecting even on the last couple of weeks that we've um, had some referrals through as well, where um it's definitely quite the uh dynamic between tra trafficking and smuggling as well so we've actually then had people that have been referred in it's it's evidence that actually it's a, a case of smuggling rather than trafficking so um and that's us working within the sector as well and working with other, other organizations that work with human um trafficking and slavery as well so i think um we're kind of seeing that come through our services um a lot more as well as a as an issue um I think that might be the last question, I'm afraid. Um, thank you for all your questions. As Dougal said, we any ones that we've not been able to get to, we will, of course, um, uh, discuss and ensure that they're, they're sent out. So I'll uh, hand over to Google, Dougal. Great. Thank you so much, um, Kate. And thank you so much, Rachel, for a really, really fantastic, um, wide ranging discussion, um, some really fantastic um, uh, points made about about the current situation. Um, I won't um, go on much more except to say that um, thank you all to our, our fantastic audience to, for, for attending as well. Um, as I mentioned at the start, the recording of this will be uh, made available and sent to your registration email um, as well as any un unanswered questions and some of the resources that were discussed um, during the, the talk as well. We'll make sure we get that all out to you. Um, I do need to uh, obligatory kind of plug for, for Unseen uh, and just to say um, that if you are <coughs> interested, um, we rely on the support of people like you to do our vital work. So please do consider donating through our website. Um, you can see the, the, um, the website URL there um, or ideally by setting up a regular gift. Um, so thank you for, for considering that. And then just to say as well, um, uh, that we are looking to do more free uh, supporter events um, like this uh, fantastic event uh, this evening on International Women's Day um, during the year. So, so do stay tuned. Um, if you're not uh, subscribing to our newsletters, then um, please follow us on social or, or uh, go to our website and, and um, sign up to email. And um, that's it, really. Thank you so much um, again to our panelists and um, have a great evening. <laughs>